Heavenly Father, as I offer these words this morning, I beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good people of the Diocese of Washington, I can only give you what I have received, and that is good news, good news that has come in good times and bad times, good news that has prevailed in times when we have been able to speak a prophetic voice in unity, in times when we have been divided and have railed against one another. Good news that has prevailed when we have been on the mountaintops, but most of all when we have been in the valleys. And that good news is this, and I think the, the scripture has spoken clearly to me in this regard as it did today in our lessons. Fruit is meant to multiply. Vines grow, servants serve, Christians encourage one another in love. Christians are called, you are appointed, you are chosen. We are chosen for just such a time as this to give away what we have received and to watch it grow. Charles Ellis concludes his essay on winning the loser's game with these words. There is a class of diseases which are called iatrogenic, meaning they are doctor-caused. The Chinese finger cage and the modern straitjacket most tightly grip the person who struggles to break free. I think there is something here for us, something that strikes me as true regarding our church institution today. The irony is that we as an organization are seeking a solution to what ails us. Yet denial and isolation are our go-to emotions within the community. We are hostile to forces outside our control and because they are outside of our control, we often turn upon one another inside instead. We think bargaining improves our status, bargaining with ourselves, with others, with people with the loudest voices, and with God. We move in and out of hopelessness, doing what seems like the acceptable norm, as if trying the same thing over and over again will change our situation, instead of recognizing that that is insanity. Any stretching, any movement to adapt, to struggle with the new contextual reality, to change the expected into the unexpected is met with resistance. And that resistance is heard inside as sound advice and just words, wisdom. The organization itself tightens its grip against innovation and entrepreneurs. Our internal doctor tells us that we must hold on tight to what we have received. And we tell ourselves that those who need us, why, they're going to find us someday. That if we work harder at our internal ministries, we will do better. All of our healthy matrix, you see, of congregational wellness is oriented around internal best manage management of ever-decreasing resources. And our ministry is focused inward instead of outward. Just do the calculation yourself in your head for a moment. Those hours spent, the money spent, the resources spent in your congregations, all on things inside the parish. So it is we actually <laughs> undermine the message that we have been given to share. We cannot face or accept that this is neither gospel nor that this behavior is futile in the face of change. We tell ourselves, hunker down, 
try harder, hold on tight. We are doctors practicing without a license. We say, yes, we can actually cure ourselves, Jesus. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, what ails us grows in the shadow of our life together. We are like fruit rotting on the tree, neither eaten and enjoyed, nor seed sown for future growth. The straitjacket of how it is supposed to be is our prescription, and it is our tyranny. The gospel paradox, though it haunts us, it comes after us over and over again, it convicts our souls, and we feel a little bit of shame about it because we know and we proclaim it Sunday after Sunday, even though we may turn away, we hear it, our hearts hear it, and we know deep inside of ourselves, in death there is life, in loss there is gain, in giving we receive and by going and being lost in the world with others in their wilderness, they and we are actually found. We know. We know. Fruit is meant to multiply. Vines grow, servants serve. Christians encourage one another in love. Christians are called, you are appointed, we were chosen for just such a time as this to give away what we have received and to watch it grow. The gospel of God and Jesus Christ did not take root, you see, in the religious organizations of Jesus' day. It did not take root with the religious leaders or in the courts of power. The gospel of God took root instead in the midst of the people, in their homes, in their mangers, on the seasides, in the hills, in the valleys, upon the rock in Galilee. The Christ came not in the expected places, but in the unexpected places. Christ came not to bless the religious faithful, no, to the religious of his day, Jesus brought challenges and discomforts. Do not sanitize his message for those who thought they knew what it was all about. And like the prophets of Israel, he reminded the religious that God's righteousness is rooted, is, is rooted in the care of the poor and walking with the marginalized. God's favored ones are the least, the lost, and the lonely. They are the dying and the dead. In fact, I would say it is hard to even hear the gospel truth if you are not one of these or yoked to one of these, these Christ's little ones. God and Christ meets people out in the world, blessing them, walking with them, talking with them, breaking bread and sharing wine with them. God and Christ Jesus came into the world not to be locked away behind closed doors but in order that love and mercy and grace might be unleashed upon the world. God brought this message to all people, especially the marginalized and the victims. Before God arose, the scripture says, God descended to be with the people in the earth, on the earth, and below the earth. God stood with them in the person of Jesus, the laborer. He stood with them, the government employee, the prostitute, the fisherman, the shepherds, and all manner of unclean sinners. If they were there, Jesus was with them. The vine came into the world, and it put a stranglehold on injustice and hatred and anger and deceit. The vine grew up and wrestled the powerful and the authorities and the abusers. Even magisterial Rome could not withstand the power of that vine. The vine, the word, was alive and found living and dwelling in the world. And that is where it took its root. That, my friends, is what the first followers believed. The first followers of Jesus understood this blessing work, this generous 
work, this traveling vagabond work, this world-rooted work. And so they went out. Like Jesus, they challenged the authorities. They spent the vast majority of their time with the poor and the persecuted. Taking Jesus' lead, they went to every kind of person. They went to the non-religious, to the idol worshipers, to the people of many nations and languages. They went to the widows and the orphans. They went to soldiers and politicians, to the beggar, the infirm, the leper, to women who ran their own businesses and households and the wealthy and the poor, to men and women and people who had no status like the eunuch. They went to the clean and the religiously unclean, the worker, and they went to the ruler. And like Jesus, they broke the religious boundaries and expectations of their day. And like Jesus, they were reviled for having been seen with sinners. Don't think for a moment that doing all that was easy and that their friends and loved ones didn't turn against them and ask, what are you doing with those people? That is exactly what they did because that is human behavior, but it is not gospel work. The tenacity of these early followers of Jesus, the tenacity of Jesus himself for that matter, was that they were committing to fraternizing with those the religious thought to be too impure and who preferred cultural and class isolation. Why did they do this, though? They did this to share the blessing that they had received with others, that they might have their hearts transformed. They did not choose to hoard the manner that they received in their wilderness because they already knew that story that it was going to rot. They took what they received and they shared it with others. The love they received, they gave to others. The wealth they had, they gave away. What they did not do, what they did not do is sit inside their upper rooms, inside their houses of worship and wring their hands about what to do. They went like Abram and Sarai, like Moses and Zipporah, like prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, and like Esther and Daniel. Those first followers got up and they went. Andrew went, James went, John went, Peter went, Paul went. And so did the women, Anna and Mary and Martha and Lydia, Junia and Phoebe. They all went a-walking. And they weren't heading somewhere. They were looking for somebody to share the gospel with, to give away what they had received. Every one of them who followed, everyone who was a disciple became an apostle and went. And boy, they learned something from their going. Everyone who thought they knew what it was all about had their mind changed. They were humbled by the work and the stumbling blocks and the words and the road that was before them. But by going, but by going, they discovered what it meant to depend upon God's grace alone. As the song goes, some were winners, some were losers, and some were born to sing the blues. Many died. Many were persecuted. Some lost a little and some lost a lot. But they had courage For the gospel was with them. And they trusted their little motley crew, their vagabond group of people. And they encouraged one another. And when they doubted, they told stories about how Jesus went among the people. They reminded themselves when they were hopeless about the truth of the gospel. Now, I know what you're going to say. You say, now, that's all nice and well, Bishop. You'll say, Bishop, though, as I read the Scripture, they had some houses, they had some places of business. As I know the story and the history, they had empty storefronts, and they took over abandoned religious places, and they gathered, Bishop, they gathered. 
And that is all true. They set up shop. But they set up shop and used those places to gather the whole community. Those became places where the good news was shared, where food and shelter could be found, and where people found empowerment to go and share what they had with others. None of those places were meant to be their final resting places. These places of gathering were never meant to be the only places where the gospel had a foothold in the world. These places were always altars in the world, for the world, sending people out into the world, meant for the world, and most of all, for the people who had no place. They were never meant to be millstones around the gospel's neck. Every asset they had, every place they took over, Every home they inhabited became either a place for bringing people in or sending people out. Every asset is to be leveraged for the purpose of mission and for the gospel. Ray Wiley Hubbard sings, Are you going to make it? Are you going to make it Diocese of Washington? Are you going to make it Episcopal Church? He goes on and he says, Yes, you got to. <laughs> you got to make it because the world is waiting for you and it needs you. You got to. All I can give you is what I know. And what I've received. I think the scripture is clear. There is no mincing of its purpose nor quibbling about its intent. Fruit is meant to multiply. Vines grow. Servants serve. Christians encourage one another. Christians are called. You, Diocese of Washington, are appointed. You are chosen, as Esther was in a long time ago, for just such a time as this to give away what you have received and to watch it multiply. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.